So Stan, tell us, how did you first become interested in space? Well, I was given a small telescope when I was a child, an 80 power thing, and, and, the, and I saw Saturn, and the rings were there, and it looked like a jewel, and I got interested at that point. We lived near the deserts of uh, Southern California and there was absolutely tremendous viewing in, at night, just bare eye viewing. And then in the high Sierra, you're up at about 10 to 12,000 feet at night and the stars are just out of this world. So I always had an interest and then later I got reading science fiction and then the solar system is more or less like the local neighborhood for adventures. And so it, it sort of followed. So first seeing the stars, then seeing the science fiction stories that take place out there. And what does space mean to you now? Well, I'm thinking of it as Earth's local neighborhood, as the context for Earth, that we're on a planet here, we're orbiting a star, and that that context is important for understanding and taking care of this planet that we're living on. So it's a kind of a home, the home environment. Now, you're one of the very rare people who's eaten a bit of Mars. Can you tell us how that came about? Well, yes. When I was finishing my Mars trilogy, it was a really big push. I was trying to finish Blue Mars, and I'd been working on the trilogy for most of 10 years. And a space fan and a reader of the Mars books named Stuart from England sent me a gram or two of Mars, and I didn't realize that if you have one of the SNC meteorites, you have a piece of Mars. So then I went online and I got some more in a necklace for my wife that had maybe 10 little chunks. And one of my friends said, knowing the struggles I was having with finishing the book, you should eat one. And so I did. It was basically a sort of mysticism to see if I could uh, help bring the book home. And does it have a particular taste? Or? It's like gravel. <laughs> now you've described space as one of the last great wildernesses. Could you explain to us what do you mean by that? I now I think that's not quite right. The wilderness is a name that we have for a particular relationship to landscapes here on Earth. So that's all very well. Uh, almost all landscapes on Earth have been lived on and impacted by human beings. So that you might say that Antarctica is a wilderness, but everywhere else has been a working human landscape. And so now we save some of these landscapes from human interference to try to keep the health of the entire ecosphere going. So wilderness is great, but that's not really what space is. It's, a, it's the emptiness in which the planets roll, and that's not exactly wilderness. But you could say this, that the Outer Space Treaty is based on the Antarctic Treaty, and that our use of the other planetary bodies in this solar system might be governed by the ways that we treat um, Antarctica. And we seem now to have a great obsession about Mars. Is there something particular about Mars that you think is special or is it just because it's the next great destination that we have to achieve? Well, there is a real fascination. I'm, I'm, people have exhibited it to me now for more than 25 years, and I've felt it myself. And it's always been a little mysterious. Why? Uh, but I think now it, there are some factors. It's real, but empty. You can see it with the naked eye. That matters. And then it's reddish, and it has that strange uh, glitch in its orbit. It gets brighter. It gets dimmer. It seems to be signaling us and it's very charismatic in the night sky. So the fact you can see it with the naked eye and you know it's real matters. And now we know it's a planet like Earth, but it's empty. Uh, nothing there and possibly dead, possibly bacteria living underground there. We don't know that. And now that's an open question. But the fascination comes from this combination of real but empty. And Elon Musk, I think, has described it as a bit of a fixed wrapper of a planet. It, it's quite a hard place to colonize. Is that right? Well, it has the volatiles that you would need if you were going to terraform a place. Terraforming is a kind of Carl Sagan idea. The, the planetary uh, community in the late 60s, early 70s began to talk about engineering a planet from a dead state to a space where human or, and earthly genetic materials could be uh, put into that space and allowed to thrive like a garden. And that of all the places that we knew about, Mars turns out to be really good at that. It has a lot of sunlight, it has the frozen water, it has uh, uh, some nitrogen. And altogether, if you had to pick the qualities that a planet might have to make it terraformable, 
Mars is pretty good. What's your best guess about when man will reach Mars? Well, this really is just a guess. It, put it this way, if the human community decided it was a priority, then we could be on the planet in about 10 to 15 years. But it is, it's expensive, and you can't make a profit from it. You simply can't. And also, there's a hard part that um, many people wave their hands at without coming to grips with, and that is that it's hard to land an object gently on the surface of Mars. We've only had a 50% success rate with our robot landers. And a 50% success rate when you've got humans on board is perhaps not good enough. So why should we go to Mars? I think that there's something going on here that my friend Oliver Morton pointed out, that we are interested in the hardest place that human beings can get to that they could never get to before, that new technologies allow to be achievable. So in the 19th century, everybody was focused on can humans get to the North Pole, and then when that happened, can humans get to the South Pole. Then it was Mount Everest, and in 1953, we got to the top of Mount Everest. Then it was the moon, and in 1969, we got to the moon. It has to be pointed out that in each of these cases, once we got there, interest in that place per se fell off drastically. There are, uh, there's a little town at the South Pole, nobody cares. Tourists go up Mount Everest for a fee, nobody cares. And we went to the moon and then we stopped going to the moon. Nobody was interested enough in the moon to keep an active moon program going, even though we had reached it. So it's the reaching it. And I'm suspecting that Mars is the same. People claim a huge interest in Mars. In fact, it's a dead rock and poisonous. You can't go outdoors. You'd have to live underground. So if we get humans on Mars, it will turn into McMurdo, uh, which is the town in Antarctica that you go to where you start your adventures. The people there are going to be happy. They're going to be interested. Human civilization is not going to care. It's the destination. So the moment we land on Mars, people are saying, I wonder if we can get to the moons of Jupiter. I wonder if we can get to the moons of Saturn, and so on. Space used to be the preserve of governments. Uh, it's now become the preserve of the private sector, or at least the people uh, putting a lot of money into space exploration are private sector. Is that a good thing, do you think, or is it always going to be a combination now of public and private sector? Well, I hate that uh, aspect. I myself am a public uh, over private person, government over business, and the reason that humanity was so interested in those tiny little rovers that landed on Mars was precisely that they weren't commercial, that they were owned by the public, and they were out there for um, the pursuit of knowledge only. There was no profit to be made from those tiny little rovers like Pathfinder and Curiosity. And that's the way I would prefer it to continue. Now that said, it was always public-private in that the US government and NASA would always contract out to Boeing and to other companies to build those rockets. And right now we have a really good rocket company, SpaceX, uh, founded by Elon Musk, that is making a really good rocket, the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy. And we needed a rocket like that, a booster with enormous uh, liftability and reliability, and now they can reuse the boosters and everything. So the innovation that is now possible because of the last 30 years of work on all fronts and the fact that low space orbit is profitable because of communication satellites means that we've got a situation where there's going to be more and more public-private um, enterprises and everything, but because mostly you can't make a profit, like you can't make a profit on the moon, you can't make a profit on Mars, what you're going to end up with is uh, a public-private combination where hopefully space will remain a commons underneath the rules of the Outer Space Treaty where no individual nation can make any proprietarial claims, but you still have um, scientific exploration being done because we need to know what space can teach us in terms of managing the Earth. And what's NASA's role in this new space world? Well, NASA's been great. They're a federal agency. The American public has supported it. The Congress has only given it a certain amount of money, and it's had to limit what it's done and make choices. But within those choices, um, it's done the best it can. And the robotic exploration of the solar system has been superb. And really, those camera views and those uh, indirect sensors that allow us to see what's going on around the other planets in the solar system, in many ways more important, it's the data, more important than human beings having been there. And putting humans in a place is vastly more difficult and expensive and complicated. So I think NASA will continue to organize the effort and also subcontract out the jobs to the rocket companies that are building certain rockets. But if you were president, would you increase their funding? 
Yes, I would. Um, it, right now, they're, they're funding as a percent of the national budget. What I guess I would like to, to see done is a flip of the Pentagon budget and the NASA budget. That would be a good start. Now, the first wave of space exploration, I guess um, you could say was quite utopian. Uh, it was, uh, we are going to have a, a man-made mission to go to the moon. Um, it was very much gonna, then the Star Trek era that this was bold exploration. And in a way, the kind of latest wave of space exploration is fueled by some dystopian fears that planet Earth is under threat for environmental reasons or some kind of super intelligence might take over. Is that right, do you think? Are we trying to escape planet Earth now? If people are thinking of going to space as an escape hatch from problems on Earth, they're making a bad mistake. There is no planet B. Earth is our only home. We cannot build a viable a space for humans to live in anywhere else, and especially not in the time that we are in a current ecological emergency here on Earth. So that's a bad fantasy, a, a sort of um, let's start over somewhere else kind of moral hazard you create for yourself, where it's okay to trash this planet or to kill ourselves because if 5,000 humans were alive on Mars, that that would make it okay. It's actually when you put it that way, unsettling how wrong it is, how uh, fundamentally wrong on the basic physics of the situation, not to mention the morality of it. So uh, things do seem to have changed from the spirit that, that it began in, but I'm not so sure that's completely true. The space exploration began as a kind of utopian effort, although it also came out of World War II's rocketry, so it's always had a military component to it. But we demilitarized space with the treaty in 1967 and it was seen as a kind of idealistic space of exploration. I think people are still mostly interested in that. When that kind of thing happens, people are fascinated by the images that come back. When people talk about making a profit up there, first you can't do it except for communication satellites in low Earth orbit and nobody really even considers that to be anything more than the sky. So for space itself, you can't make a profit. And it, when you talk about it as maybe a tourist destination, the trivializing of space is just almost absurd. It would be outrageously expensive, and it becomes like the equivalent of bungee jumping. You know, bungee jumping, you jump over a bridge, you stretch, you go down, you come back up. Oh, how wonderful. Bungee jumping upwards is going up into space, you spend a half a billion dollars to do it, and then you come back down. Is that really all space was for? A uh, rich person's bungee jumping? I don't think so, and nobody thinks so. So uh, what's going to happen, I think, is that it's going to be the public rallying behind their public space agencies, the uh, European Space Agency, the Chinese Space Agency, the Indian Space Agency, and NASA are all going to be spending part of the people's budget on projects like this and contracting with private companies. Uh, if tourism um, piggybacks on that later on, that's sort of the way things happen. It's that way in Antarctica. And almost everything that, if you think about how is it going to be in space, imagine how it's already been in Antarctica, and it will be like that. Would you personally like to go to Mars? If I could get to Mars in two weeks and get home in two weeks, I would love to go to Mars. Uh, the usual transit times are probably uh, declared to be more like nine months, and uh, that seems a bit much to me. Imagine being trapped in a Motel 6 for, you know, nine months, and then, I don't know, that would be a close call. We live in a global capitalist economy, and capitalism depends on permanent growth. And once you are in a finite system like the Earth and its ecology, there's a point it comes where permanent growth can no longer happen. And that's one name for the crisis that we're in right now. The ecological crisis that we're facing is the maxing out of the ability to continue to grow in a capitalist economy in Earth's finite system. Some people have then begun to imagine, well, that means that the next zone of expansion, the next uh, will be space itself, and that's where we'll be able to keep capitalist growth going. The problem is, space has nothing that we can uh, exploit and appropriate and turn into profit, because what's most common up there is precisely what's most common here. Water, dirt, uh, silica, aluminum, iron. There's nothing that is up there in uh, concentrations that we can turn to use. So this uh, dream of a uh, solar system as the next zone of capitalist exploitation is not going to work because we can't uh, rally those places like we did the places here. But in that sense, do you think space is a symbol or 
an area of opportunity for genuinely global collaboration and exploration? Yes, I think because we all signed the Outer Space Treaty, and this was uh, negotiated between the Soviet Union and the Americans back in 1967, and then now the Chinese and everybody else has signed off on it, it's an area where you're not to make territorial claims, and you're not to have militarized activities. And then what you do there is research together. And if we ever did find resources up there, then the use of the resources would be done without making territorial claims. Again, it would resemble the ocean or it would resemble Antarctica. So that's a great challenge of getting past uh, nation-state rivalries and getting to a broader human cooperation as to what we're, what we're trying to do in the world. And you don't think some of the plans for asteroid mining are going to lead to anything? Well, I don't, because the asteroids are made of nickel and iron. And so what you, when you're thinking, oh, you could go up there and you could get uranium? No, you can't. Could you get gold? No, you can't. The asteroids are the most common stuff we have. Uh, stony, or else they're iron, or else they're nickel. One thing that has interested me lately is this common story that we used to have that humanity was destined to go to the stars and inhabit the stars, I think is wrong and was a mistake based on our misunderstanding of just how big the universe is. And what uh, turned the key for me was the microbiome inside us, that 50% of the DNA inside our bodies is not human DNA. So when you go to the stars, you actually are, uh, have to bring that healthy forest that is you it, with you and keep it all healthy and all evolving at the same pace. So the, even the nearest stars are um, you know, 12 light years away to Tau Ceti. That's 10 billion times the distance from here to the moon. And that quantitative difference has, creates a qualitative difference that means that essentially the stars are out of reach. And that story we've been telling ourselves is wrong. And again, even more emphatically, there is no planet B. Earth is our only home, and we have to make a good accommodation with this only home that we have. When I wrote the Mars Trilogy, um, I pushed the timeline to the minimum amount that might be possible to terraform Mars, just for the sake of my story, to keep some characters around for most of it. Uh, now I still think that Mars is terraformable and would be great to do so, but we've discovered it doesn't have anywhere near as much nitrogen as we thought it did, and that creates a bit of a problem. And also it has perchlorates covering the surface, which are essentially salts poisonous to human in a parts per billion range. It's way more poisonous than we thought it was. And also there might be bacteria living underground. And these are three new things I didn't know at the time, and none of them are stoppers, but each of them is a big slower downer. And so now I would say about Mars, yeah, terraform it. It might take 10,000 years. It's still a great idea. And uh, to have a second home like that, it, it, say it is 10,000 years from now, humanity, if we've solved our problem, should be just hitting our prime at that point. And then we would have this quite incredible achievement, an Earth-like planet that we ourselves gardened and put in place.